Awesome. That's exactly great. That's exactly the reason this panel exists. You how many of you me? How many of you know the old value comics from, from back in the 90s? Awesome. And how many of you have been reading our books that have been coming out since 2012? That's great. a pretty healthy mix. Um, all right, so before we get started, we're gonna we're gonna dive into the, the origins and the foundations of what you need to catch up with some of our biggest characters. Before we do that, let's talk a little bit about what Valiant is and what has made it special for the past 25 years of comics. Uh, Dinesh and Fred both have uh, lots of experience uh, with Valiant. Can you explain a little bit about the history of Valiant? How did it start? What made it special? Fred has more experience than I do. Just just so anyone's there, he's older than I am. <laughs> <laughs> So Valiant was started in 1989. Uh, Jim Shooter, who had been the um, the, uh, the, chief, the, chief, uh, the chief executive, I just forgot. Editor, um, editor in chief of Marvel, See, old. had <laughs> left. Yeah, no, just had left Marvel and was looking to um, to buy Marvel um, at the time. Uh, he failed in buying Marvel at the time. Some billionaires beat him out. So during the course of that transition. He actually found he wanted to start a new comic book company, which uh, which became Valiant. He brought along a lot of his uh, a lot of his guys. He brought along Bob Layton, <coughs> Ron Perlin, um, to restart the new comic book company. Uh, eventually, Barry Windsor Smith got involved. David Black got involved. Some of the Randall biggest names in involved. comics at the time. Yep. So it was a it was a huge yeah some of the biggest names. Um, and we relaunched the comic book company. Um, we started it with. Uh, some western pro with some with some western IP intellectual property, and then what happened? We launched with uh, our own property with uh, EXO, uh, Bloodshot, and a number of a number of other characters. Valiant at the time became the third largest comic book company in the industry. We rivaled DC. Uh, we were almost overtaking DC in terms of market share. Um, we were at the same time we became we launched and became big at the same time that Image launched. Um, and there's a rivalry between uh, Valiant and Image as to who is actually the number three company. <laughs> <laughs> right, and so Valiant was very, very successful because they focused on storytelling. So Valiant, Valiant branded themselves as a company that would outright the competition. So when you came to the original Valiant books, you saw this, this tremendous love for storytelling, you saw this deep relationship with the reader, you saw this morally ambiguous, complex characters, and we've tried to keep that going as well. So when we relaunched in 2012, we took the, uh, the, the Valiant characters who had been bought by a video game company and mismanaged and had been out of the market for a little while, we brought them back in 2012. And we launched with uh, four titles, X of Man of War, which is our, kind of our flagship title, Harbinger, which is our team gritty, uh, realistic team book, Archer Not Strong, which is a, uh, a buddy comedy, and um, Bloodshot, which is a big sci-fi action book. We wanted to bring the same point of view to the books. Uh, so everything we do is, is of the utmost quality. We don't publish a lot of comics, for those of you who are new, publish about eight to ten titles a month. It's, it's a, a small fraction of what the big publishers publish, but every single thing that we publish, you can you can rest assured, is the best comics we can make it. Yeah, and we've limited ourselves, we've limited ourselves quite conscientiously to a select number of titles. I mean, we've been around for three years. You guys hear me okay? I'm just saying, yeah. uh, been around for three years, but we haven't tripled in size in that time. Our market mm -hmm. share has doubled, but we've still, um, you know, capped ourselves at, a, at a, not a, a, a finite number of titles, but around the level where we're every title as high as possible with some of the um, best creators in the business right now. Um, so this is, as you can see up on the screen, this is a selection of some of the titles we published to date. Um, Exo Man of War, as Dinesh mentioned, is our flagship rise, a, a title set in the far future of Harper Bridge through a team book. Uh, Val the Valiant was a, a book we'll be talking about a little bit later that's something a bit unlike anything we've done before. Ivar, Tom Walker, Divinity, Bloodshot, Archer, Armstrong, Imperium. The interesting thing about where Valiant is right now as a publisher is um, though we relaunched with some of the uh, more familiar properties that a lot of you guys remember from back in the day, uh, when we came back in 2012, we really reached a point out where in the line as it stands in 2015 is about half new concepts, half. Um, right. If you're a new reader, this is this is still it's still early days. We're only three years in, again, because we don't publish a lot, there's not a lot to catch up on, but it's an exciting time for us because we've now reestablished some of the big guns in the Valley universe. We've had so much success, but we've been emboldened to try new things, things we're not in the original universe. So we've got some books like Divinity and titles like Imperium that, that explore new ground. And we, we try as much as possible um, to make it that you could pick up any Valiant book and read right. that book. We have a recap generally. If it's not a number one book, because with a number one book, you understand that you're learning things. 
uh, about the character. But if it's not a, if it's not the number one book, we have a recap so you can catch up. So in theory, you could pick up any Valiant book and read it. Also, the Valiant books, because we're a, a small company and we're, we're it's a tightly knit universe right now, we really can uh, explore what's going on in the world today. And our, a lot of our characters are very good about talking about. You'll read in a Valiant comic about things that are happening outside your window right now in the news right now of what's going on. And we pride ourselves in that, that we really are a contemporary reflection of what's going on in the world today. So the, a character that many of you are probably familiar with is Exo Man of War. How many of you guys have read Robin Diddy and uh, Carrie North's Exo Man of War? Awesome. Um, for those of you that haven't, Exo was, uh, is what we consider to be our flagship character. It was the launch title of the universe. And that was a character that when we sat down and we all said, we're bringing Valiant back, how are we gonna do that? I think we all agreed that, that Exo should be the number one character that we're doing. Mm -hmm. um, Fred and Dinesh, can you guys give us a little sense of who our Odyssey is? How did he come to be Exo Man of War? If, if you think about Exo, Exo is a character from the, uh, from the fifth century. He's a Visigoth. His whole life was fighting. He was fighting the Romans. Um, and, and he was trying to protect his people from, the, from this large Roman Empire onslaught to take over his people. Um, he, in, the middle of a, in the middle of a major battle, he gets, he gets captured. He thinks he's, he thinks he's chasing the Romans, but he's really thinking uh, he's really captured by aliens. The aliens take him on, a, on, a, on, a, on their ship way out to space, and he's forced to be a slave laborer. He captures the armor, which is a religious icon he, he, uh, to, the, to his captors. He captures the armor. He can use the armor, and all of his captors were dying every time they try to use the armor. He uses the armor. He escapes, and he wants to go back to see his wife and his family and all of the people he loves. He lands in the modern time in Italy, in Rome, but it's not, for, it's not 420. It's today. And so what we have now is we have the... The, the man who's the most primitive in terms of time, you know, in the most powerful, in the most powerful weapon of the Kennedy universe. And the reason why um, Ark winds up in the modern day after rocketing up a spaceship is kind of a reflection of that real world approach to superheroes. Uh, one of the distinguishing characteristics of the Valley universe is a lot of it is obviously still a comic book, but we try to, to always ground it in as much real world science as possible. So due to the effects of time dilation, um, and relativity, are was traveling at the speed of light for X amount of years. Right, he's traveling faster than light. So when you got back to Earth, 1600 years of time. You guys all saw Interstellar, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> it's an awesome book. If you haven't checked out, we highly recommend it. It's, uh, it's basically a man out of time, most powerful weapon in existence. He just triggered the invasion of Earth. It's a big, epic sci-fi story. So any of you that feel like Iron Man or Captain America or Thor, this is a great book to jump into. And something that we've uh, tried to do with Robert from Diddy, the writer, uh, who also you might know from books like Green Lantern and The Flash of DC, he's really tried to to make every single arc of this thing a big a big budget blockbuster movie in and of itself. So we've seen things like um, the invasion of Earth. We've seen alien armored alien uh, uh, teams come down to Earth to try and kill us. So we the arc that we're in now is a planet made up of robots that, that comes to Earth and splits up into tiny little robots and tries to attack Earth. And, uh, and Rx got to stop them, X Amount got to stop them. This was Conquer Resources Book of the Year, it's Annie Cool News' the best ongoing series, so it's, it's a good one. And we have it at the booth, here's my plug, for just $10. Yep. And so, X Amount was a rival on Earth, even though all of our characters kind of exist in different genres, they'll have a little bit of a different tone, we do have a shared universe. The Valiant Universe is the third largest shared universe anywhere in comics uh, behind Marvel and DC. Um, which has given us the opportunity to introduce a lot of uh, the other major characters, the other major concepts through those original series. Um, if you were reading Bloodshot or Archer and Armstrong or EXO, you got to uh, to meet a lot of people in passing, a lot of cameos or introductions that would go on to have greater significance that we're still working with today. Um, one of those is not the wedding of X Man, where although we'll be uh, talking about that a bit more tomorrow at our dying 25th anniversary. <coughs> Um, one is Ninjak. So in the second arc of Exo Man of War, he encountered a MI6 agent by the name of Ninjak, whose allegiances we were a bit unsure of. He's not quite hero, not quite villain. Uh, he dresses in purple and has a funny accent and lives in a castle. Um, he's, he's essentially Eurasian Batman, if Batman was a ninja. Uh, but he's awesome. He's become a fan favorite. He's also kind of an ass. He's got a sardonic, yeah. sarcastic uh, English approach to, to life. Which didn't <laughs> exist really in the original character, I think. 
Rob kind of gave that to him, and then Matt Kent has really picked up that ball and run with it in, in his own series. Yeah? Who knew Rob and Diddy, the secret English, uh, I'm trying to think of a word that won't get me in trouble, asshole. <laughs> <laughs> So do we have any Ninjak fans out there? Yeah. Ninjak is one of those characters that, that uh, was unfortunately, and I always disagree with it, was on the receiving end of, of a couple jokes, you know, when people talked about, about the Valiant characters, and it's really been one that we introduced him back in episode number five, really took on a life of his own, almost immediately. Yeah, we've got the new series just launched, Matkins Writing, and who is here at the show. We've got this first issue, check it out, it's phenomenal. I have to say it's one of the best things we've done. Oh, we've worked with him. Yeah, we do have worked with so. Uh, Matt has done something very, very uh, sneaky with this book and very um, kind of complex, um, which is he's dealing with three separate timelines. You open um, the first page of Ninja Act number one, you meet young Colin King as a boy in a movie theater, um, watching a movie that starts with a Z, which if you're a Batman fan may seem kind of familiar to you um, about a young rich kid who goes to a movie that starts with a Z, but Matt uh, knows knows all that and is kind of doing like a meta-level commentary on what it means to be a, uh, you know, a superhero vigilante. Um, artwork for this book is by Clay Mann, which is absolutely stunning. You can check this out, uh, some of that right up here. Um, can you talk a little bit about the, what threat Ninjak is up against in his, in his new series? Matt has uh, built out kind of a new mythos uh, right. for Ninjak a little bit. So, so the mythology of Ninjak is that, that he was trained uh, in this monastery uh, where the, the greatest ninjutsu uh, monks are, and he was one of seven others who were trained the same the same level of skill. And the story that we're telling right now is in three different timelines. One is the the first mission of Ninjak at MI6. One is a present day mission, and then one is the kind of origin story is uh, uh, him as a child. And we're telling 13 issues. And by the time you get to the 13th issue, the the story when he's a child will reveal something that will make you go right back to the beginning. It's kind of a mind trip. Um, but, but what he's doing is he's hunting down the other seven to make sure he is the baddest of badass ninjas. So what you'll find in Ninjak, you'll have a 22 page story, which is a regular story that, that will follow, and then there'll be eight pages of a story that, will, that you'll see sort of make sense with it, and then for the next issue, it'll be 22 pages of story and then eight pages of story, but then when we come back to, when you circle back to the end, you'll see that it will make sense and it will all tie together. Just like a lot of the Valiant Titles. There's a lot of depth in the writing. It's not just you know slam bam um, comic book writing. You'll see that there's if you look at Bloodshot not Reborn Number One, it's a, it's it's a very deep um, process. There's a lot of writing. It's, it's a lot of action. There's a lot going on. But there's also something we we also try to you know to make you think because that's really where we are in the modern world where we we want our entertainment, we want our fun, but we also want. And it's like a massive comic book each month. It's 40 pages each month for the standard cover price of $3.99, which to my knowledge makes it the biggest monthly comic on shelves for a standard cover price. You get 22 pages up front of, you know, really flashy superhero art by Clay Man, as you can see there. And then you get this kind of gritty uh, second feature, like a Robert Lotham style spy thriller by Matt Kent and uh, Butch Dice. Uh, I'm sure many of you know from his work on um, Winter Soldier and Action Comics and Captain America: The Winter Soldier. Um, so we have a phenomenal crew of people working on this. And and plus Matt does a little um, 60 style cross section of one of Ninjax gadgets in every single issue. So it's packed, packed to the gills. And we'll be doing something very cool with the uh, the upcoming arc that we'll be announcing tomorrow at um, our 25th anniversary now. Um, see, you, see you then. And now for something completely different. Quantum and Woody, <laughs> the world's worst superhero team. Do we have any Quantum and Woody in fans? <coughs> For sure. So there's, uh, we've encountered a lot of Valiant readers who came to the universe through Quantum and Woody. Um, they're irreverent. Um, I wouldn't trust them uh, to babysit my kids or anything. Um, I certainly wouldn't trust them with this panda. <laughs> um, can you guys tell us a little bit about the history of Quantum and Woody and, and what they bring to the Valiant universe? Quantum are, they are, as Hunter says, the world's worst superhero team. Imagine two idiots get superpowers, and then they get a goat. That's essentially <laughs> the goat. It's two adopted brothers, Quantum, uh, Eric, and, uh, and Woody, two adopted brothers, and as brothers often are, they, uh, they don't always get along, but they're stuck together because the, the bracelets that give them their powers have to be clanged together every 24 hours or they'll disappear. So now they're stuck together, they decide to be superheroes, Eric decides uh, he's going to take the name Quantum and get a full-on suit. Woody decides that it's ridiculous and he's just going to be called Woody. 
and no one's gonna hunt him down and then strike fear into the people he loves. Um, and they go and be superheroes and realize they're really, really terrible at it. And they also realize that the, uh, the goat that they've been saddled with happens to possess the mind of the, of the father that they were trying to avenge. Um, so it the goat's a whole thing. Yeah, it's a whole thing. It's best we don't go down this road. You can do an entire goat one on one panel. And, and, and the father is the one who designed the bracelets. I mean, it really goes far. It, it really is very funny. Um, and it is one of those books which is truly humorous when you read it. It is laugh out loud humorous because we do have two idiots who are superheroes. Um, so this book is written by, has been written by James Asmus since its inception, uh, with going back in 2013. Had a really uh, strong lineup of artists work on this over the past couple of years, including uh, Tom Fowler, who launched the book, uh, Ming Doyle, Steve Lieber, Steve Lieber, who's uh, just about to wrap up Quantum and Woody uh, Must Die Number Four, which is the latest Kano. anime series with him, and then Kano, um, who did a couple issues of Quantum and Woody, the proper series, and then we did a crossover with Archer oh, Armstrong right. called The Delinquents. Can we do a segue? Sure, I don't have any art, but we can talk about it. All right, The Delinquents is a team up between, well, this is the most nominated book of the heart, but I just want to say that. So if you're a Deadpool fan, so that's the, check this out. That's the other thing that I'll, I'll say before we talk about The Delinquents, is that this sounds patently ridiculous, but the Quantum of Relief uh, has an incredible fan base and has been incredibly well received. So it's one of our most successful titles. Traits continue to sell phenomenally, mm -hmm. um, and it was the most nominated award, uh, most nominated uh, series, the series of the Heart of the Comic, the letter of the Harvey Awards, which is one of the most series. prestigious awards in comics. Um, so the delinquents, okay, delinquents, Quantum and Woody, and two other bumbling idiots, Archer and Armstrong, in our universe. Uh, Arch Archer is 18 years old, he wants to save the world, Armstrong is 10,000 years old, and he just wants to get laid and get drunk, uh, which to be honest is, is what everyone would do if they were 10,000 years old. Uh, they get together. What's what men do? <laughs> uh, they get together and they go on this this treasure hunt for lost hobo treasure. And the lost hobo treasure map is tattooed on the ass cheeks. This is the skinned ass cheeks of a hobo. Uh, and if you can imagine the skinned ass cheeks of a hobo, right? X marks the spot. And it's a great book. You should check that out. It's also at the booth. Very, uh, very highbrow stuff. <laughs> <laughs> But they did, a, they did a really good job with it. I wish I had art to show you. Um, this is a comic book that has a full-blown musical sequence in it. I should have, it has a, I should have, uh, when I was doing that. Yes. I would have sold it. Um, it has a, what are those, uh, it has one of those action clings from the 80s in it. Oh, yeah. Um, the, I forget exactly. And a board game. We built a board game. So and it has a board game in the back. So you can play a legitimate uh, Quantum and Woody versus Archer and Armstrong board game in the back of the trade of uh, the delinquents. And we actually had to play test that thing in the office. It's actually, it's actually pretty fun. And it had to be continually revised as they were play testing it, even after it was printed something. Um, it's surprisingly hard to build a good board game. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it is not all just uh, goats with the minds of, of your foster father inside the medallion. Uh, we also did recently did a book called The Death Defying Dr. Mirage, which again is something completely different, straddles and uh, steps into an entirely different tone and genre. Um, we had an incredible response to this title. Um, it was written by Jed Van Meter with art by Roberto De La Torre. Um, the character of Dr. Mirage, who's uh, a paranormal investigator, uh, was first introduced in our series Shadow Man, but this was really her first uh, leading solo adventure. And one, one of the best things we've done. Honestly, the, this is the first show we've had the trade at, and it's selling gangbusters. Uh, this, this book, so the, the two that you see, can we go back a second? The, the two that you see here are husband and wife, paranormal investigator team. They both have powers, and they've got this TV show, like an A&E show. Uh, no one believes them, but the, the truth is they really do have powers. And then they both die, and she's revived, but he isn't. So he goes off into the afterlife. And her power has been that she's able to talk to ghosts. So um, uh, she spent her whole life talking to the deceased, but she can't find him, she can't talk to him. And the story is this, this epic Tolkien-esque story of how she goes into hell, uh, to Hades, and, and journeys through the, 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 the seven realms to find her, her lost husband and bring him back. And it's this big, epic love story, supernatural love story. And it's it's pretty awesome. So if you're if you're a fan of your gaming or you're a fan of saga, uh, this is definitely what you should check out. And the artist Roberto De La Torre was working with one of our uh, best colorists, a guy named David Barron, uh, who's worked on all a lot of the most prominent series in comics. He colored Planetary. He colored uh, The Authority. We're very fortunate to have working on this. This is one of the first. He really poured himself into this, as did Roberto. And it's really a phenomenal looking book. It's it is not your typical superhero book. It's uh, I would call it a little bit understated, but it's mm -hmm. absolutely beautiful to look at. Um, 
and, and it's a true love story. If you're not someone who uh, is big into you know guys in armored suits punching aliens, um, <laughs> the death of five guys or ass maps or ass maps. Um, you, can be, you, you can be into all of that, by the way, and live in our universe. Dr. Mirage is a great series to try out to find out um, how we do things a little bit differently in value. And I don't think this is the kind of book that would get published a lot of other places, especially from a superhero publisher. Um, and speaking of which, another another series that I would also give that um, qualifier to is The Valiant, uh, which is um, a mini series that we started publishing in December of last year. It just recently concluded. It's written by Jeff Lemire. Uh, do we have any Jeff Lemire fans in the house? Yeah. Awesome. Jeff is phenomenally talented. Uh, we were very fortunate to get him uh, over to Valiant to start working for us. Um, he's good friends with Matt Kent, and together they decided to co-write this miniseries that would really be kind of a, an epic that spans 10,000 years of history, um, which is quite a uh, ambitious feat when you only have four issues, but they had a very good board to, to help him out with a, a, a fellow by the name of Paulo Romero, who is one of the best artists undoubtedly working in comics today. He won two Eisners uh, for his run on Daredevil with his father, Joe Rivera. It was a big coup to have him come over to Valiant to work on this book. Um, did any of you guys pick up the first couple issues of this? What did you think? Good stuff? Cool. Um, for those of you who are familiar, we do have a trailer I can play for you that will give you the, uh, the brief summation of, of what this is about. Through her, 
we get to meet not only the, the modern incarnation of the immortal enemy, who as you can see there on the right, Paulo Rivera did an absolutely creepy as hell job of, uh, of designing, but uh, we get to meet all of the all of the biggest heroes in the Valiant universe, the least of which is not Bloodshot. But over the course of the series, you get to meet virtually everyone. And this is the first time uh, since we relaunched in 2012 that a lot of these characters have been seen on the page together. For instance, Quantum of Woody and Ninjak uh, had never gotten together before this. Um, did actually talk a little bit about what made the Valiant special, why this was a big turning point for us as a company, and why it's a little bit different? We, we really went all out with this book. So Jeff Lemire, Matt Kim, two of the best writers in the comics. Paolo Rivera might just be the best artist in comics. So he's only done like 16 issues, he's kind of a savant. Um, and we did a prestige format book, and we, and we told an epic story that, uh, that set the mythology for the Eternal Warrior, and, and it kind of changed everything in the Valley Universe. Um, and this book has been tremendously reviewed. It's, it's literally one of the best things that's come out of comics in the last five years. And we built it to be kind of our Kingdom Come, or our Marvels, a place that you could go perennially if you want to try the Valley Universe. And, and I, think, uh, I think the guys accomplished that. I think they did a great job. It's hard to talk about this book without giving away the, the big turning points, the ending. Um, which was very controversial, but, but very beloved, has become very beloved. Uh, I don't know what to say without giving that away. So there are, uh, even though this is a completely clean entry point, if you've never read a Valiant book, this is something that you can easily hand to any one of your friends or relatives and say, this is what Valiant is all about. It's really a statement of what makes our characters different in comics. Um, and although it just wrapped up, there are a few um, key points towards the end that set up elements that are going to be playing out over the next couple of years, if not the next decade of Valiant comics. Part, Go ahead, part of what we try to do is we try to have points where you can jump into the universe because quite honestly we believe once you jump into the Valiant universe, even if you jump into a small piece of it, you'll really be brought into the rest of it. So if, if, any, if, if, a, if you're a store owner or if you're somebody who's been thinking about jumping into the Valiant universe but you don't really know um, which one to, we have, where to start, the Valiant is a perfect place to start. It will really give you an introduction to all of our characters, and it will give you an introduction to what's actually coming next in the Valiant. Um, so you're going to see elements of what uh, the ramifications of the ending of the Valiant have in an event we're doing uh, this summer called Book of Death. It's going to pick up directly in the aftermath of this. We'll be talking about that a little bit more tomorrow as well. Um, but also in the pages of Bloodshot Reborn, uh, which is a new series that launched. First issue hit just about two weeks ago. Uh, this is Jeff Lemire's first ongoing series at Valiant with a very talented artist uh, by the name of Miko Soyan. Did a lot of covers for us, but this is the first time he's really done a full length uh, arc on a series. And as you can see, he's an absolute uh, freak. His artwork is totally incredible. Um, it's like covers. He's one of the best cover artists, and we give him enough time. Every page looks like a cover, but it's, it's built for storytelling. Um, so this hit two weeks ago. We've seen an incredible response to this book. Uh, again, there's there's an element in here. We can't spoil exactly how Bloodshot winds up in this position, but this is a great place uh, to jump in with Bloodshot. I think of Bloodshot uh, as our next biggest character behind X and War. He's one of the biggest characters in the Valley Universe, to be sure. Uh, we had a big long run of a Bloodshot series before this, but you do not need to have, you know, you don't have to know everything that happened in Bloodshot. You don't have to have read all those issues to, to pick up Bloodshot Reborn. Uh, Jeff. When he sat down to write the value with Matt, they knew exactly where they wanted Bloodshot to wind up. Um, so this is a series that's been in process for a year since the original idea of the value came about. And the, the beauty of, of, of these writers is they really know the storyline of, of what they're doing. So while Bloodshot Re Reborn, we're on issue number one now, we have 25 issues that have been outlined, and we are, we are currently drawing issue number 10 and 11. So, you know, that's how far along. So they can foreshadow and they can make it, you know, they can, we can make it, you know, excellent literature, um, which is something that you, you want your writers to do. And no one, no one else in comics has done that. No one else in publishing is organized enough, frankly, to be able to, to work that far out ahead. And when you do that, you can really create quality stories. Um, and if you are uh, a diehard Valiant reader, if you are reading uh, most, if not all, of our books, this is going to be one of those series that is at the main line of what we're doing. There's going to be some very important things happening in this book over the course of the next two years that are going to shape really the future of where the value of the universe is headed. And we're extremely excited about what Jeff and some of the very talented artists uh, that he's going to be working with have in store. Um, after Miko wraps his first arc uh, with issue four, uh, we've already started work on the second arc, which is by Butch Geis. Um, Again, a legendary artist who we're very fortunate to have working for us. He was doing those backups in Ninjak as well. And then following that, issue 10, 
you know, I told you we were very, very far out ahead on this. Uh, this is artwork by Luis La Rosa. He's a guy who <coughs> never does interior artwork. Um, so as you can see, we're working on three arcs of this book simultaneously. Writing is occurring even farther out ahead. This is extremely rare in uh, monthly superhero comics for a company to be working this far out ahead, and it's allowed us to get some really, really, really high caliber artists. Um, I mean, this stuff is just crazy to look at. And, and Bloodshot Reform just launched in April. Um, it, I believe it launches a top 25 and 30 book of the month of April. That's how powerful the book, and that's how well received it is. And we have copies of the booth. <laughs> for those. For sale. Another um, interesting thing we're doing um, is this web series called Valiant Origins. So one of our reasons we're doing this panel today, one of the reasons we like to come out and talk to folks like you at, at conventions all across the country is we really want to be um, showing people what makes our characters different and uh, not relying on years and years and years of continuity. It should be easy to jump into comic books any time. I think all of us did that. Um, you know, we came into a comic at a certain time and we caught up fairly quickly. Um, but there's often the impression that you need to be, you need to have a PhD in, in, in value continuity mm -hmm. to be uh, familiar with these characters. But that is not the case. And to that end, we've created this, this web series, Value Origins, and be coming out every couple of weeks on YouTube. They're quick, uh, two minute, two and a half minute summaries of everything you need to know about our biggest characters. Um, I'm about to show you the first one that is indeed for Bloodshot, but. Um, We'll be doing uh, a whole cast of characters. We're going to do Quantum Winnie in a few weeks. We're about to, we're about to do Divinity. We're going to do Live Wire. Live Wire will be the next one. Uh, She's awesome. Yep. Uh, but let me show you folks this. So the question is, Dark Horse has a couple characters, Solar and Magnus, for you new readers. Uh, the original Valley Universe was launched by licensing three characters in the 50s, 50s and 60s. Uh, those characters, left, the licenses left before we got involved. Uh, we have no uh, plans to be involved in those characters going forward, although they are great characters. We, we love the characters, but we don't feel those characters are really part of the current Valley Universe. And we have integrated characters that weren't part of the original Valley Universe. Parkham and Woody, while it was uh, a part of Glenn Comics, which was what Valiant had become, it, I, most people don't realize it wasn't part of the original Valiant universe, but we did absorb them into the Valiant universe. I, as, as the publisher, I didn't really think, and, and Dinesh didn't think it, it was the, as the 
achieve creative works. So that had really enhanced the universe. I think the universe, the way it stands today, stands as strong, if not strong, as the Fred hates Torah. Hates. Torah. <laughs> Torah. <laughs> Actually, I kind of agree with you on that one. <laughs> 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 but it's the way the world was cool. Sorry? The cerebral world was cool. I wrote my, I wrote the script to Magnus 20, so I'm talking about a character that I actually wrote the script for it at the time. I just don't feel it fits into the character. Actually, I'm glad it wasn't up. Now we can talk about it. So it Magnus is still on that great book was, until he got involved. Magnus, <laughs> <laughs> Magnus, 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 Magnus 20 was actually a great writing exercise. Uh, Bob Layton was not a great reading exercise. <laughs> Bob Layton said, you know what, we have all these finished uh, we have all this finished artwork, but you know, the guys who wrote it aren't around anymore, so why the story around? So look at Magnus 20 and say it was a great job by you. That's and actually the reason we don't want Magnus back. <laughs> <laughs> I ruined it. Um, yes, sir. For our digital readers, do you have them uh, do you have for our purchase on or do you have for sale on Absolutely. So um, comics are all available, <coughs> classic and modern, are all available day and date on Comixology, um, trades as well as single issues. And then we're also available on practically any um, digital comics platform that is currently operating. Yeah, comics Crunch, Comics Fix, Graphically, Scribs, Ivers, uh, basically any comics platform digitally, you can find our stuff there. We've been very aggressive about getting our content on as many digital platforms as possible. And if you can't find it on a platform, let us know, because we'll have the, the group that really handles that, make sure that we can hand it on. But it, it really should not be difficult to find a value on any given platform. Yes, miss. Uh, Superman seems like they're getting a Because it was designed at, there's three eras of superheroes. There's the 30s. We didn't want Fred to finish that sentence. Let's, 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 we all knew that. There's the 30s when um, DC Comics was created. There was the 60s when Marvel Comics were created. To a certain extent, they were all reflections of their time. They've been updated and modernized over time to try and correct some of the things that we may not be so comfortable with today. The great thing about the Valley Universe is these characters were created all, uh, the earliest ones were created, what, in 1992, 1993? Mm -hmm. And then new characters have been created uh, and added to the universe practically every year since that time. And so it's a much more modern, contemporary, diverse superhero universe than you are going to find from, you know, uh, characters that were created in 1940. It's just baked into the, a lot of the we, concepts. We have very strong female characters built into the Valiant universe. Um, so, you know, Dr. Mirage is very strong. There is no better character in the, in the comic book world than Faith, the female character in the comic book world than Faith. Uh, so, yeah, Faith... Zephyr Herbert is the character that we didn't get a chance to talk about. But we have a friend specifically didn't get a chance to talk about that, sorry. But we have a book called Harbinger that is a, is a team book that has three female characters out of five on a team, and it is one of our most popular and, and best selling titles. Hunter's always afraid of what I'm going to say on the panel, by the way. That's not true. Hunter just likes to control people. It's happens in the open all the time. And my favorite female character, that new female character that we have, is a character called Punk Mambo, which you will be seeing. Do we answer your question or do we just argue amongst yeah, ourselves? Thank you. <laughs> uh, yes, sir. First, I just want to congratulate you on a really great job you guys did teaming up with Catalyst Game Labs for your role playing game. Thank I you. think thank uh, you. they did a did really you bring nice your own job. Mic to this, to Pardon this question? Me? Did you bring your own mic for this question? No, oh, we filmed it. Is it okay to film? I'm, so I'm not giving you guys the link then. <laughs> I understand you have some Hollywood related news. Would you like to share that with the audience? Sure, sure. I'd like to talk about it. So, so uh, first let me say we're a comics publisher. A lot of other publishers like to uh, play that they're something different than that. We have no illusions of being a movie studio or video game developer. Having said that, licensing and film are just part of the, the narrative in comics today. And we've been telling stories that people seem to like. And so uh, we have had interest in, in doing something important. We recently announced that uh, we partnered with a, a Chinese company uh, that become a minority investor in, in Valiant, and together we raised a nine-figure co-financing film fund, and then we partnered with Sony, well this is actually older news, we've announced it now. Uh, we have previously partnered with Sony to tell, um, to bring Bloodshot and Harbinger to the screen. 
Bloodshot will be coming in 2017. We're doing a five film plan. It'll be Bloodshot in 2017, followed probably by Harbinger, sequels to the two of them, and then Harbinger Wars will be the crossover film that we're doing with them. These are all big $100 million uh, tentpole uh, uh, global films. Uh, and Harbinger Wars, we're very proud of this because Harbinger Wars is a story that we told after the first year of publishing. Harbinger and Bloodshot, we launched them, we told one year of storytelling, and then they crossed over to Harbinger Wars, which was the best reviewed event of the year. Um, and now we're going to be able to tell that story and adapt it to screen, hopefully. Which is crazy. Like, that doesn't really happen. Yeah, it doesn't really happen. It's, um, it's probably one of the biggest things to come out of independent comics since, since The Walking Dead uh, TV show. Uh, so we're phenomenally excited. We'll be talking about it a lot more as, as those things become closer to uh, fruition. Um, as, as these films come out, are you going to be doing the movification of your comics? In other words, reflecting the movies, are you going to try to keep? No, you know, you know what's great is because we co-finance the films, where we have a seat at the table. Listen, we don't control the films, obviously. Sony's a massive company. They're, they're putting a lot of money into this. They're distributing it. There's other people involved. The producer of the Fast Furious films is involved. The, the directors of John Wick and directing Bloodshot. So we have a seat at the table, and we're able to put together a team that really loves comics, and they understand comics, and we get to be able to uh, sit down and explain why all you guys love Bloodshot. So the film that hopefully you'll see on screen will be a very, very good story that not only is a great film, but also a reflection of the comic. Now it won't be exactly scene for scene, but you'll be able to go to the movie, see the movie, and feel like, oh, this is the character I know. Or if you come to the movie before you've ever read the comic, be able to then go to the comic and say, hey, it's the same character, it's just a different story. And of course things will change, there'll be things we'll do to take advantage of the, the motion of the camera, or the sound effects, special effects, that you can't do in comics and vice versa. But yeah, we won't be, won't be shifting the narrative in the, in the comics to fit the screen. Again, we're a comics publisher first and foremost. And they wouldn't be interested in making these movies in the first place if the comics, you know, if they didn't like the comics to begin with. So um, there's a there's a key reason there to keep it similar to the source material. The success of the superhero movie comes out of the how, how um, out of our genre, out of the superhero genre, it doesn't happen the other way. And whenever they try to do it the other way, we find that the movies don't work. We find that they so we have to be pure to what we're doing when we create comic books, and they have to take the essence of what is put into a comic book and put that on the screen. I will mention the film, but you know the films that do work, and you know the films that are supposed to work, and, and die, die horrible deaths. Fred meant steel. He means that's the movie that works. <laughs> <laughs> that's the one that works? Yeah. Um, no, that's one that uh, is divisive. Um, any other like questions? We have time for just two or three more. Yes, sir. Sure, N Nin is the name. Ninjak is, is the kind of name, if you hear it, first you think, what, what is a Ninjak? Uh, they just trademark, uh, they stick a K at the end of Ninja and try to trademark it. And if you don't know the character, you don't know what it, it stands for. So it's, it's, and it's from the 90s, you know, when the image was art focused and uh, there was all these gimmicks and variants coming out of every publisher. Um, so Ninjak became, in a, in a way, one of the poster children for the excess of the 90s. And it was really nice for us to be able to, refreshing for us to be able to come back and show people why Ninjak is great. Because if you go and take a look at the original Ninjak book, some of the best creators in comics have worked on it. Joe Casado was the artist in the first three issues. Co created the character. Co created the character, the CCO of, uh, of Marvel. So it's a brilliant character. Being able to, it's all these characters. The potential is there for these characters to be the biggest in the world, to be global characters that people to fall in love with and can teach you things. And we see it as our duty to, to be able to give them that life. Ninjak is a great example of it. It's really great evidence that. You, that it's not the characters that are faulted, it's, it's what you bring to it. So we have a lot, we have a really, really great foundation with a lot of our characters at Valiant. Uh, very pleased that you guys have responded as you have to them. And, and our editorial staff and, and the creative teams really uh, try to be true to the, uh, you know, to the original concept, but also to the new concept. And everything is excellence. I mean, everything they do, they're, they're doing the best they can to the last minute. And you know, the readers always know when love isn't put into it, and the best isn't put into it, there is there is love in everything that's being done in the book, and they're they're doing. You know, Warren uh, Simons, our editor in chief, and, and all the editors um, are working as hard as they can to put out the best books they can. Every book that they've put out, they've put out on time. Every monthly book has come out on time on the day that we said, which is for three years. It's never happened before. You know, it's, it really is a labor of love by everybody in the company, except for one person. I won't mention who that is. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so just 
that's the key is to make sure that the you know that you just don't do a character because you need that to fit that character. You know, we do the character when the character's right, we launch it. Um, and because we're doing eight, 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 eight to ten characters a month, we can, we have time to let characters breathe. We have let we have time to let the editors and the creative staff work to get it right. And um, and then we relaunch just like we did with Bush. One last question. I know you had a question. For the 25th anniversary, is there any uh, plans to revisit Value One and Two universes in reflection for like a special? So you, know, you guys did Q2 this last year, the return of the second, yep. the first original Quantum Awake. It was hysterical. It just got funny with every issue. Um, we did revisit the. If you've read any of the, some of the Valiant Masters books, we did a few um, new stories set in the original '90s universe. Um, but I think with our core wealthy potion line, we've, 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 we've talked about that. We've talked about we've talked about something with the old credits about coming back. And Hunter's right. We've released these uh, compendiums of the original books. We've added new stories. We don't. I think it'll happen eventually. We all love the original universe, but it might be too early. Is there any plans to like do a one shot with all those little short stories from all the reprints of trade paperbacks of the old to the guys who have all the original issues? No, but we can talk about it now. It's a good idea. We haven't thought of it. Yeah. Thank you. One more question? Yes, sir. Is it hard to have a shared universe where you have like the more silly characters with more serious characters? I think it's an advantage. It's just hard to have a shared universe. It's tough to get the right to get everyone talking. But no, it's it's uh yeah, I think it's I think it's an advantage. It gives more more opportunity. You don't want to have just grim and gritty one to monotonous tone across the universe. I mean it, it's a universe, it's gonna have a diversity of, of tones and genres and uh lifestyles and characters. I think it's more realistic that way. It's the world the way it is, you know. You, know, whatever, whatever, you can't, you know, something as small as a high school, you have that, and something as big as the nation, you have that. You know, there's all kinds of everything in every universe. It was, you don't want a monotone. You don't want a flat universe. I think I saw two more questions, and then we can wrap. Yes, sir. A lot of that did a uh, humble bundle about it. Um, yeah. I, that was a wonderful, fantastic deal. Uh, I was wondering how it came across. You guys saw that it was a success, and maybe plans to do another bundle like that. I thought that was a great introduction. Yeah, huge, huge success. It was a massive success. We keep getting people to uh, to the booth that said they jumped in on the Humble Bundle and they, they're loving all the books now. We find that all we have to do is get you to read one Valiant book and, and then you're want, hooked. And then we want the rest of you to be our pushers. Once you read a Valiant book and you're into it, you have to push it on to everyone else. Um, so we, we've been telling them about doing another one, so at some point we will do another one, yes. Yeah, was, awesome. But it'll be, it'll be a while, it won't be soon. And, and the Humble Bundle in particular, you know, with all the promotions we do, that was one of the Brought new people into the universe and brought non talented groups into the universe. Versus the promotion where we had Fred White and issue of Magnus, which pushed people away from the universe. Uh, it was 20 years ago. We're still, so we're still talking about it. Yeah. You're just jealous. You weren't writing comics 20 years ago. Um, do you have the last word, my friend? Yeah, uh, being new to the Valiant Universe, uh, Bloodshot, is that a symbol on his chest, or he was wearing a t-shirt with the circle? Uh, I don't so know. Bloodshot, the character Bloodshot, he's a soldier who was killed in action, they bring his broad body into a project rising spirit, they pump him full of nanotechnology, billions of microscopic computers, and it comes in through his chest, and that's the scar tissue from, from the needle array that comes in these nanites, they rebuild him, they rebuild his brain, but they can't rebuild his memory. It's like saving the hard drive, but not saving the data, so he becomes uh, this kind of a uh, he becomes a guy that can control his physiology better than anyone, so he can repair muscle damage, he can breathe underwater, he can, uh, he can make his bones strong, he can change the way he looks, his melatonin. He's human plus 10%, but he can't remember who he is, so, um, so he goes on a mission to find out who he is. But that is the, that's where the, uh, the nanites are inserted, into this, into this bloodshot chest thing. And in Bloodshot Reborn, he does paint it on a t-shirt. Yes, yeah, so it becomes a symbol, a symbol of Bloodshot. Um, that's all we have for you folks. Um, Appreciate it. One more, one more thing. Um, if you come down to the value booth, what is the booth number? Do you know off the top of your head? <laughs> 317. Oh, Sorry? 317. 317. It's very hard. Right through the main entrance. You can't miss it. Um, you'll see the big value banners. Come down to the booth. Um, say the password. Ninjack. Come to the booth. Tell one of the guys in the value t shirt the secret password, Ninjack. We always bring a special surprise. It's a big thank you for all of you guys coming out here, taking time out of your day to join us at our panels. So we'd love to come uh, see you down there. Say Ninja Jack, we'll have a special surprise for you. Hey, hey, you, why are you leaving early? Who's that guy? <laughs> oh, it's, it's Matthew Klein. Tell <laughs> Matthew, Matthew Klein, sit down. He's one of, the, one of the guys you're going to want to tell Ninja Jack to. Uh, <coughs> let's go see um, some of our artists.
Yeah. Clint Henry's here. He's Matt Kent is here. I'm Ryan Matthew Curran is here, our, our illustrious salesperson. Actually, uh, Matt Kent will be signing in 25 minutes at the Valley Booth. He wears Divinity, yep. Unity, Rye. Get some books signed. Ninja, you wear Ninja. Thank you guys so much. Thanks, guys.